Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are still working on Wittgenstein. I uh, wanted to let you know, someone asked me um, what percentage of this that I understand. Less than half, to be perfectly honest. Uh, most of this does go over my head. Some of that's just going to be because he's referencing things that I'm not, like uh, other works that I'm unfamiliar with. Some of it's going to be language issues or culture or time issues. Some of it's just going to be Wittgenstein is really, really smart and he can be difficult to understand sometimes. So if some of this, most of it go, is uh, not landing, that's okay. Uh, I think there's a, we'll, we'll take what we can get and we'll uh, maybe revisit this another time to see if we can capture some more of the uh, insights that he had. Uh, I am in a different uh, place right now because my laptop battery decided to crap out on me, so it has to be plugged in all the time now, which is suboptimal. But you know what isn't suboptimal? Wittgenstein. So let's hop right back in. Actually, I wonder if I were to ask, ask Wittgenstein if he would consider this to be suboptimal. He probably would have come up with some something else uh, by now. Just a little background for you, by the way. Um, Wittgenstein is interesting because he wrote these books. Uh, uh, he, he wrote some stuff and he basically thought that he had finished philosophy. And so he quit doing philosophy for a while um, because he thought it was over. He's like, ah, this is done. Nothing left to do. And then later in life, he came back and wrote this, what we're reading right now, Philosophical Investigations, because he decided that actually, man, eh, there was still some stuff left to do. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what he came up with. But what if no such sample is part of the language, and we bear in mind the color, for instance, that a word stands for? And if we bear it in mind, that it, then it comes before our mind when we utter the word. And if we bear it in mind, then it comes before our mind when we utter the word. So, if it is always supposed to be possible for us to remember it, it must be in itself indestructible. But what do we regard as the criterion for remembering it right? When we work with a sample instead of our memory, there are circumstances in which we say that the sample has changed color, and we judge of this by memory. But we cannot. But can we not sometimes speak of a darkening, for example, of a memory image? Aren't we as much at the mercy of memory as of a sample? For someone might feel like saying, if we... had no memory, we should be at the mercy of a sample, or perhaps of some chemical reaction. Imagine that you were supposed to paint a particular color C, which was the color that appeared when the chemical substances X and Y combined. Suppose that the color struck you as brighter on one day than on another. Would you not sometimes say, I must be wrong, the color is certainly the same as yesterday? This shows that we do not always resort to what memory tells us as the verdict of the highest court of appeal. Something red can be destroyed, but red cannot be destroyed. And this is why the meaning of the word red is independent of the existence of a red thing. Certainly it makes no sense to say that the color of red is torn up or pounded to bits. But don't we say, the red is vanishing. And don't clutch at the idea, but don't we say the red is vanishing. And don't clutch at the idea of our always being able to bring red before our mind's eye, even when there is nothing red anymore. That is just as if you chose to say that there would still always be a chemical reaction producing a red flame. For suppose you cannot remember the color anymore. When we forget which each color, when we forget which color this is the name of, it loses its meaning for us. That is, we are no longer able to play a particular language game with it. In the situation then it is comparable with that in which we have lost a paradigm which was an instrument of our language. I want to restrict the term name to what cannot occur in the combination X exists. Thus one cannot say red exists because if it were so, no red, because if there were no red, it could not be spoken of at all. Better. If X exists is meant simply to say X has a meaning, then it, it is not a proposition which treats of X, but a proposition about our use of language, that is, about the word, the use of the word X. And indeed, the, whether or not existence is, what the phrase is existence a predicate, I'm vaguely remembering some issues that, um, I'm remembering something with Kant now, but I can't quite remember it. <clears throat> I think it had something to do with the ontological argument and Kant saying that existence isn't an attribute because it it pre anything else you can say about something presupposes its existence, so existence doesn't count among the other attributes. I wonder if that's a little bit what we're getting at here, a, a little bit. Um, thus, one cannot say red exists 
because if there were no red, it could not be spoken of at all. Better, if X exists, is meant simply to so you say, we say, the Statue of Liberty exists, is meant simply to say, the phrase, the Statue of Liberty has a meaning, which in this case corresponds to an actual thing. Okay. Yeah, because I can say blah 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 exists, but does it though? Because if blah 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 doesn't mean anything, or if I'm not indicating anything by it, then the sentence is sort of empty. Hmm. Interesting things. It looks to us as if we were saying something about the nature of red and saying that the words red exists do not yield a sense. Namely, that red does not exist in its own right. The same idea uh, that this is a metaphysical statement about red finds expression again when we say such a thing as red is timeless, and perhaps still more strongly in the word indestructible. But what we really want is simply to take red exists as the statement of the word red has a meaning, or perhaps better, red does not exist as red has no meaning. Only we do not want to say that the expression says this, but that this is what it would have to be saying if it meant anything, but that it contradicts itself in the attempt to say it just because red exists in its own right, whereas the only contradiction lies in something like this. The proposition looks as if it were about the color, while it is supposed to be saying something about the use of the word red. In reality, however, we quite readily say that a particular color exists, and that is as much to say that something exists that has that color. And the first expression is no less accurate than the second, particularly where what has the color is not a physical object. So yeah, indeed, what would red mean if there were no red things? We wouldn't... If there were no red things, then what would red even indicate? I mean, for red to exist, we would have to see a red thing first. I mean, you could say that the concept of red exists even if all red things were destroyed, but would we know it? And in what sense does it exist anymore? I don't know. Exists in potential, maybe? A name signifies only what is an element of reality, what cannot be destroyed, what remains the same in all changes. But what is that? Why it swam before our minds, why it swam before our minds as we said the sentence. This is the very expression of a quite particular image, of a particular picture we want to use. For certainly experience does not show us these elements. We see component parts of something composite, of a chair, for instance. We say that the back is part of a chair, but is it, but is in turn itself composed of several bits of wood, while well, a leg is a single component part. We also see a hole which changes is destroyed while its component parts remain unchanged. These are the materials from which we construct the picture of reality. This reminds me, I was having a discussion a while back about objects that are... Uh, that we refer to with singular names, but nevertheless consist of multiple disconnected parts. Uh, so my favorite example of this is a French press. Um, a French press, if you just have the pitcher, you don't really have a French press. And if you just have the plunger, you don't really have a French press. But they're not attached to each other. Um, if you didn't have the plunger, you wouldn't say, oh, get go get the, fresh, the French press over off the shelf. You would say, go get the picture. Uh, part of the the picture part of the French press over off the wall um, a friend of mine gave the example of a caravan as well as another good example of this um, one car doesn't or one wagon doesn't a caravan make it's all of them they're the caravan but they're not connected to one another obviously um, at least not necessarily when I say my broom is in the corner is this really a statement about the broomstick and the brush well, it could at any rate be replaced by a statement giving the position of the stick and the position of the brush. And this statement is surely a further analyzed form of the first one. But why do I call it further analyzed? Well, if the broom is there, then it surely means that the stick and brush must, all, must be there in a particular relation and in a particular relation to one another. Indeed, it wouldn't be a broom if they were disconnected from one another. And this was, as it were, hidden in the, in this, hidden in the sense of the first sentence and is expressed in the analyzed sentence. Then does not someone who says that the broom is in the corner really mean the broomstick is there and so is the broom and brush and the broomstick is fixed to the brush, is fixed in the brush. If we were to ask anyone if he meant this, he would probably say that he had not thought specially of the broomstick or specially of the brush at all. And that would be the right answer, for he meant to speak of neither the stick nor of the brush in particular. 
Suppose that, instead of saying, bring me the broom, you said, bring me the broomstick and the brush which is fitted onto it. Isn't the answer, do you want the broom? Why do you put it so oddly? Is he going to understand the further analyzed sentence better? This sentence, one might say, achieves the same as the ordinary case, but in a more roundabout way. Imagine a language game in which someone is ordered to bring certain objects which are composed of several parts, to move them about or something else of the kind, and two ways of playing it. In one, A, the composite objects, broom, chairs, tables, etc., have names, as in example 15. And the other, B, only the parts of are given names and the wholes are described by means of these. In what sense is an order in the first sense, second game, an analyzed form of the order in the first? Does the former lie in the latter? lie concealed in the ladder and is now brought out by analysis. True, the broom is taken to pieces when one separates the broomstick and brush, but does it follow that the order to bring the broom also consists of uh, corresponding parts? But all the same, you will not deny that a particular order in A means the same as one in B, uh, and what you would call the second one if not an analyzed form of the first. Well, at least certainly a, they would accomplish the same thing. A particular order in A and B would accomplish similar things, um, so long as the analyzed version was appropriately sort of conveying the meaning. Certainly, I too should say that an order in A had the same meaning as one in B, or as I expressed it earlier, they achieve the same. And this means that if I were shown an order in A and asked, which order in B means the same as this, or again, which order in B does this contradict, I should give such and such an answer. But that is not to say that we have come to a general agreement about the use of the expression, to have the same meaning, or to achieve the same, for it can be asked in what cases we say, these are merely two forms of the same game. Suppose, for instance, that the person who is given the orders in A and B had to look up a table coordinating names and pictures before bringing what is required. Does he do the same when he carries out an order in A and then the corresponding one in B? Yes and no. You may say, the point of the two orders is the same. I should say so too. But is it not everywhere clear that, the, I, that, um, that what should be called the point, but it is not everywhere clear what should be called the point of an order? Similarly, one may say of certain objects that they have this or that a purpose. The essential thing is that this is a lamp, that it serves to give light, that it is uh, an ornament of the room, fills an empty space, etc., is not essential. But there's not always a sharp distinction between essential and inessential. To say, however, that a sentence in B is an analyzed form of one in A readily seduces us into thinking that the former is the more fundamental form that it alone shows what is meant by the other, and so on. For example, we may think, if you have only the unanalyzed form, you miss the analysis. But if you know the analyzed form, that gives you everything. But can I not, but can I not say that an aspect of the matter is lost on you in the latter case as well as the former? Let us imagine language game 48. Uh, all sorts of the, the names signify not, 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 these are the square ones. Uh, the, the language game involving the squares alters the, the name signify not monochrome squares but rectangles each containing each consisting of two such squares let such a rectangle which is half red half green be called u a half green half right one half white one v and so on could we not imagine people who had names for such combinations of color but not for the individual colors think of the cases where we say this arrangement of colors, say the French tricolor, has a quite special character. In what sense do the symbols of this language game stand in need of analysis? How far is it even possible to replace this language game by 48? It is just another language game, even though it is related to 48. Here we come, across, come up against the great question that lies behind all these considerations. For someone might object against me, you take the easy way out. You talk about all sorts of language games, but have nowhere said what the essence of a language game and hence of language is, what is common to all these activities, and what makes them into languages or parts of language. So you let yourself off the very part of the investigation that once gave you yourself most headache, the part about the general form of propositions and of language. 
And this is true. Instead of pr producing something common to all that we call language, I am saying that these phenomena have no one thing in common, which makes uh, us use the same word for all, but that they are related to one another in many different ways. And it is because of this relationship or these relationships that we call them all language. I will try to explain this. Uh, I think I'm going to call it right there. Normally I try to get through two whole pages on one of these, but he's about to launch into something uh, particularly important, I think. So I'm going to call it there. Uh, thank you so much for reading along with me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please give the channel a subscribe and the video a like if you wouldn't mind. And y'all have a good one.